But I want to talk to you for the next few minutes about the most important word you will ever know, and that is love as it comes from God, God's unconditional love. I ask you for the next few minutes to put every thought and every definition of you, of what you have about love on the back burner. And I want to take a glimpse at an almighty God who loves us unconditionally. I qualify right now before I finish this message that in case you miss what I'm saying, one of the most misunderstood things in this world is when people use the term God's unconditional love. We fail to mention that that love goes upon every person from Hitler to Saddam Hussein to you. But when God loves people, he loves you so much, he will let you make choices. If you include him in that choice, he will be involved in your life. If you do not include him, his love is wasted on you. Now, I knew y'all were going to shout me down right there, but I got reason to say what I'm saying. So if you put on your seatbelt and hang on for a few minutes, I want to talk about God's unconditional love. It is found in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that God gave the best that heaven had, which was his son, to come to this world, to die for wretched people like you and I, to redeem us from a devil's hell. What does that mean? To, yeah, give the Lord a hand for that. That's good news right there. And it says, and so I believe for me to start this this morning, I must look at something David said because this challenged me my whole Christian walk. In Psalm 8, in verse 3 and 4, it says, When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. I have to ask myself this question. David said, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou hast visited him? When I went through the phase of, of, of doubt and, and pity and, and, and beating up on myself, I would often go to God and I would say, God, what am I? A wretched word. Why do you care what Howard Jones does? Why do you care what humanity does? We are at war. We murder babies. We kill each other. We've disqualified marriage which is a very sacred and holy thing god what is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou visitest him but i only asked that question because i was coming <clears throat> to god with my limited understanding of a god who is perfect a god who does all things well a god who is not limited nowhere <laughs> Do we, well, let me just move forward. I want to share this. It's burning in my heart. When I read that question, I began to be challenged by it. I believe everyone in this room is challenged by it. I believe possibly every one of us, after we stumped our toe, or after we have fallen, or after we've made some stupid mistakes, we would feel unworthy and unqualified, and we would wonder, God, why? Would you care about a worm like I? But to understand God's great unconditional love, we have to rewind. Let me share a couple of scriptures for the foundation of what I want to share in the next few minutes. I find in scripture, then in 1 John 4 and 16, in 1 John 4 and 8, it says not that God has love, but that God is love. Can you repeat that with me? God is love. Now let me say it again. Say it with me. God is love. Love is only a characteristic of our emotions that we try to learn about. But God himself is the embodiment of love. The embodiment of love. It's not that God has love. God is love. And then we begin to look behind the veil. 
We begin to look into eternity. Not only this, this is what you've got to understand about God's unconditional love in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. And the easiest way for me to share that is from the New Living Translation. It said, God showed his great love for us by sending Jesus to die for us while we were yet sinners. Do you understand? While we were lost and undone in the fullness of time, Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made of himself no reputation, come down and picked up a hunk of clay just like you and I have, embraced it as his own so that he could redeem us before we were born he paid a price for you that was undescribable in our human language and yet it's only for those that respond to that love i must say this again a lot of people have misunderstood god's love and they think his love is acceptance His love is not acceptance. His love is reaching down to people who are unworthy and making a way for them to know him in an intimate way. If you live for yourself, you will never know the fullness of God's love. If you choose hell over heaven, God will love you up to the very gate of hell. When you fall into the lake of fire to spend eternity there, he will love you all the way there knowing that he paid a full price to redeem you out of there, but he gave you a will and you can choose him or you can reject him. But for me to share with you what burns in me this morning, I want to look at two verses of scripture just to share with you. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then Revelations 22 and 21, the very last words of the great Bible. It says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Now, to understand the last verse, I want to return to the first verse. If you will be patient with me for a moment, I want to paint a picture that I want to challenge the thinking of our society, the thinking of a watered down Christianity that looks more like the devil than they do God. Not to say that out of reproof, but if you have wrong thinking, you will live wrongly. For me, for this few moments, I want to share it with you. If we for a moment step into eternity past, when God is the eternal being, Evolutions believe in eternal things. They believe in eternal rocks. It's a lot easier for me to believe in an eternal God than an eternal rock. So back in eternity past, a God who is love, whenever it was, he created the angels, the seraphims, the cherubims. He looked out over the throne room It paved the streets with pure gold, built gates of pearl, foundations of 12 beautiful stones. He set up the order of heaven, and there the seraphims and the cherubims and all of creation, all the angels were crying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. In heaven there was perfect order. But somehow in a God who is not just have love, but is love. And he's feeling the praise from all of his creation. Everything that God could see, touch, hear, smell, and feel was there to give glory to him. But in the reality of that beautiful and perfect state, the only thing that was missing in the heavenlies was somebody that was there because they wanted to be there. Every angel was doing what they were created to do. Angels had no will. You say, oh, yes, they did. Remember Lucifer? Lucifer taught all of heaven one thing is you better not have a will. You better not question what you were created to do. The gold was shining. The gates of pearl were glistening. The foundation was was echoing beauty throughout all 
of creation and all of the universe. And God looked around and he saw the seraphims uh, and the cherubims uh, and the holy ones, all the, the, the smoke filling the temple and all the glory. And he thought, you know what? Uh, everything I see, uh, I created them to worship me. But my love, uh, I believe I want to create something that will have a choice in the matter. I want to create a creation that will have a say-so in whether they are here or not. Uh, I believe that God looked into eternity future because he is not limited whatsoever. In Revelation 7 and 9, it says after this, uh, and this is what John saw when he got up into heaven. He said, after this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude uh, which no man could number of all nations and all kindreds uh, and all people and all tongues. Uh, they stood before the throne uh, and before the lamb uh, clothed in white robes uh, and palms in their hands. Uh, and they cried with a loud voice, salvation is to our God which sitteth upon the throne and to the lamb. The thing about that picture in Revelation 7 and 9, all those people, not one of them was made to be there. Every one of them had a choice. When you get to heaven, you'll not find anybody looking around and saying, oh, I didn't want to be here. You will find only people who chose to be at the throne, responding with love back to a God who is love. And so with that in mind, I believe we rewind back to the beginning. And God looking at all those creatures that were doing what they were created to do. And it says in God, in the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He reached back and God stepped out on nothing and created everything that you and I know. I don't believe it was cause he was bored. I don't believe it was cause he was playing with creation. I believe that God knew when he flung the stars into the sky, when he slung the, 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 the planets into place and he reached down and he grabbed dust and breathed into to the breath of life. God created the first creation ever. And he put in Adam the ability to say no. I don't know how young you were when you first fell in love with another person. I was in second grade. I feel hard. And to this day, that young girl never knew I had a thought because my love was one sided. God, in all of creation, until he reached into dirt and made man, all that was one sided. They offered it because that's what they were created to do. Adam rose up out of the dirt, immediately had relationship with God that spoke all things into existence. And God watched Adam make choices as he named every animal in the garden. And God watched Adam as Adam needed something else. And he reached into Adam's side and he pulled out a rib and he created woman. And now out of all the creation, the trees were doing what they were created to do. The animals were doing what they were created to do. But there was a man that could go this way or this way. Who could go eat an apple an orange or a banana, all the herbs was there for him. 
And then one day, he was making all the right choices. And he saw Eve over here. What's Eve doing? What is, what is the mother of all living? What is she doing? She's over here having a conversation with a serpent. The snake, I believe that since we know she turned and gave it, the fruit to Adam, that Adam knew full well what was going on. And he heard the whole conversation and Adam stood there when he should have made a choice to say, stop talking to the serpent. Eve carried on this conversation. The serpent began to explain to them how you have a choice now. You don't have to do what God says. The essence of the conversation is, what if God's holding out on you? What if God is not telling you the truth? Maybe this fruit could make you wise. Maybe it's the best fruit you'll ever have. And all of a sudden, for the first time, do you got to hear this? In all of creation, since Lucifer thought for a millisecond, that he was going to exalt his throne above the throne of God. And Jesus said, I beheld him as lightning and come to there for the first time in all of creation past. A man and woman stand with a free will, making a choice between God and the devil. Talking about love, here's where I go tilt. God in his sovereignty had to know, had to know that there was a possibility that they would make the wrong choice. And when I come to terms with what I'm sharing with you today for years, I struggled with the understanding. God, you counted the cost before you created man. You saw into eternity future and all men were not there. How could you create man anyway, knowing that the majority of men and women will choose hell and choose Satan as their father instead of you? I felt God responded. He said, you don't understand love. That I counted the cost and my love for those standing around the throne surpassed the great price that it was going to cost to be there. You know, I thought about it. I still wasn't satisfied. And then one day I realized, how many of you in here are a parent? You are a parent. Can I tell you, in the moment that you conceived that child, there's no greater expression of you being built in the image of God than in that moment. Do you know what God has trusted you with? Do you have any idea that when we decide to have a child, a son or a daughter, that it's not some flippant decision. It's not some, oh, I just want to make a baby. You in that moment, when the, when the seed is fertilized, the egg is fertilized, and in a womb, there is a creature that comes alive in creation. That life is an eternal being. Every man and woman made a choice to have a child. You birth something that's going to live for an eternity somewhere. And all of a sudden, I realized that when I and Joanne made a conscious decision to bring a baby into this world, that the responsibility was bigger than me teaching that little girl what the best sports team is. It was bigger than teaching her that a Chevrolet is better than a Ford. It was bigger than saying this and that, that when she come out of that womb, I got in the first glimpse, I was there in the room. And when this baby come into this world, there was an eternal being. And if there's any time in man's existence that he's anywhere near like God is, 
is when you bring a baby into this world because you just created an eternal life and you can't help the decisions it ultimately makes. For you to bring a baby into this world is to risk that that baby will grow up and go to hell. It's to risk that you will not be the best parent. Come on, are y'all hearing me at all? This would be totally irrelevant today, except now, as a father, I understand why God created man and reluctantly gave him a will and reluctantly put him in a place to make a decision. And Adam made the wrong decision, and he ushered into our society sin, sickness, disease, and catastrophe, and tragedy. And man has been contending with it ever since. But God so loved the world that in the fullness of time, he sent forth a son born of a virgin. But it was his son to buy back what Adam lost in the Garden of Eden. Give the Lord a hand. I stand before you today. When I say unconditional love, I'm not talking about the love that a carnal parent has to bring babies into a carnal world and never tell them about the love of God. It's more excited about their occupation than their relationship. If mortal men will do that, how much will a loving God put us in a position to make right choices? If you're in this room today, under the sound of my voice, Almighty God loves you so much that if you get a glimpse of his love and if you respond to his love, it will be the best decision you ever made. And when that scene, I don't know where. I tried to imagine Revelation 7 and 9 when people of every tongue, tribe, and nation are there before that throne because they chose to be there and they're worshiping God. They're just worshiping God. I, sir, I, ma'am, am in that number. You, if you're born again, you are in that number. But if you choose to walk as the father of this world and the devil you will not be there but God loved you sir he loved you ma'am that he's done everything legally possible not to cross your will but to leave it intact in your life choose God or choose hell it is your decision but you but when you choose God loves you so much. He will let you choose hell. If there was no hell, there could be no heaven. If there was no place of darkness, there could be no place of light. And God loved everybody on this entire planet so much that he says these words, for God so loved the world he gave every resource of heaven to redeem people if they would believe in jesus see believing in jesus doesn't mean you believe he exists the bible says the devil believes he exists but when you believe him enough to follow him that there's a woo toward him instead of the degradation of this world. Then you only and only then do you begin to understand God's unconditional love. Let me tell you something about hell. It grieves me to think I have loved ones there. It grieves me to think of those in my life who left here with no evidence that they knew God. But here's what I do know. Whether it's my daughter or my father, if they don't choose God, they reject him. People think there's a gray area. I'm in the middle. I'm not a bad sinner. I'm not a good Christian. 
There is no center. There's only God the Father and Lucifer the Father. You bow your knee to one every day of your life, no matter who you are or what you do or how much money you have. Every moment you walk, your knee is bowed to one or the other. But the good news is, whosoever believeth in the finished work of the cross, whoever it is, is Sodom Hussein in that rat hole that they found him in before he got hanged in the courts of his own land. If he bowed his knee to Jesus, you will see him in heaven. God has made a way for the rankest of sinner. The chiefest of sinners can come to Jesus because the unconditional love is always available, but it's only available to those that receive it. God loves you, but he loves you so much. You choose what you want to do. It is the gift of God. As the musicians come, I argued with God. I hear these doctrines of what will be, will be. And it's all going to be okay for everybody. But when I read scriptures, that is not the case. The things in heaven are what will be, will be. And heaven has not changed from eternity past to eternity future. Because everything there is doing the will of God but out of all the creation you got a choice you ma'am you sir have a choice you receive it and then you show God what it's worth to you by your lifestyle see I'm not a man that believes everybody is going to make it the Bible's clear only those that choose the cross are the only ones in Revelations 7 and 9. I know you think in our society, oh, you're so narrow-minded. Can I help you with something? Jesus was the only currency to redeem fallen mankind. He was born of a virgin, and God himself was his father. You know why? Because Jesus was the first one that walked on the earth as innocent as Adam was before the fall. But once Adam was contaminated by sin, all of his children were contaminated by sin. But one more time, God sent another son, his only begotten son, into this world who was as perfect as Adam before the fall to redeem us out of Adam's failure. And out of Adam's sin. You know, my dad didn't leave me much. You know why he didn't leave me much? He didn't have much. And that's what Adam did for 4,000 years. He's left humanity broken and fallen. But when Jesus come, the Bible says this. I'm sorry, I just, I got to close right here. Romans 8, 32. He, God, who spared not his only son, but delivered him us up for us all. How shall he not with him freely give you everything you need?